Hello, my name is Coogan Collins, and I am the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. This is my review of the second night of the debate between David Hester and Don Preston. In this debate, Don is in the affirmative and David is in the negative. In this debate, Don gets very frustrated and even makes what appears to be a personal attack on David. However, in Don's last speech, he says that it wasn't personal. But you can make your own judgment call as you'll get to see this later. As I did in the first debate, I will play parts of the speeches, but I will summarize much of what is said and I will not cover every point, though you will get to see more of the debate in this review than you did in the first one. With this in mind, let's listen to Don's proposition and his first argument. Now, in the first debate, I didn't define my proposition as David wanted me to, so I'll satisfy him. My proposition says resolve the Bible. I accept David's definition of that. We all know what that means, the 66 books of the Bible, both old and new. It teaches, it imparts knowledge and understanding that the final, the second coming of Christ, and by that I mean the coming of Christ predicted in Hebrews 9, 28, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, 23, and other passages. The attendant resurrection of the just and the unjust, by that I mean the overcoming of the death that entered the day Adam and Eve sinned, and that would be the resurrection and fulfillment of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. By occurred at the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, I mean it took place, it was fully accomplished. Now ladies and gentlemen, it is absolutely undeniable. I don't know of a scholar in the entire history of Christianity who has denied or said otherwise, but that the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be to overcome the death introduced by Adam. As in Adam all men die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. My argument here, my foundational argument is the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be to overcome the death introduced by Adam the day he sinned. The death that entered the day Adam sinned was not physical death. And David Hester agrees with that. Therefore, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 was not to be or was not to overcome physical death. Folks, you just have to catch that fundamental argument. Now, if and when I prove this argument to be true, it will establish my affirmative and it will be the death of David Hester's eschatology. Point number one, the identity of the death introduced by Adam the day he sinned is easily established. Yahweh said to Adam and Eve, a very, very tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat thereof. For in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Now God said, in the day you eat, you will surely die. Here's an undeniable fact. Adam and Eve did not die physically that day. They died 900 years later. It raises the question, therefore, did God lie? No, he did not lie because they did die that very day when they were kicked out of the garden and out of the presence of God. And by the way, David agrees with that. We need to understand, therefore, the death of Adam. Prior to our first debate, I asked David, quote, is physical death the enemy of the child of God that is redeemed and forgiven by the blood of Jesus? Yes or no? He answered, quote, no. Satan is the enemy of all Christians, but it is the final enemy that will be conquered at the second coming. Listen very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. Death was always a part of the created order or created world. You have the changing of the seasons, which requires death. That was created before man. So death was an element of the physical world man would inhabit. Man escaped death because God put him in the garden and made it possible for him to eat of the tree of life. When man was removed from the tree, death occurred, physical and spiritual. Man was removed from the presence of, of God for his good. You just have to kind of catch that last phrase. Folks, since when is it good for man not to be in the presence of God? I thought that was the focus of eschatology, to bring us into the presence of God. Now, as he continued answering my question, David said that physical death was a, quote, necessary part of the law of creation. Now, listen to me. 
I agree with most of what David said in this quote. Do you, do you understand that David and I are in agreement here? It's important. Let's talk about David on death. Physical death was, quote, necessary, unquote, but it was also natural since it was a part of the created order before God created man. That means it was natural. And David said death was always a part of the created world. Now, watch this. Prior to sin, prior to sin, in the world that God created, where death was a necessary, natural part of that order, God looked upon everything that he had created and declared it to be good. Physical death, ladies and gentlemen, existed in the garden since the changes of the seasons for David entails death. So unless there was no changing of the seasons in the garden, then physical death was in the garden prior to sin. So once again, physical death was necessary, it was natural, and it was good, and it existed in the Garden of Eden prior to sin. Catch that fundamental fact. This is absolute prima facie for proof that physical death is not the death that entered in the day you eat, you will surely die. And I suggest to you, this is the death of David Hester's eschatology. I want you to ask yourself this question. When did the death, unquote, to be overcome by the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, when did that come? When did it enter? Well, once again, the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would overcome, quote, the death that entered the day Adam sinned, as in Adam all men die. But the death that the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would overcome did not exist prior to sin. Let me say that again. The death that the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would overcome did not exist prior to sin. you got to catch that. When did the death to be overcome by the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, when did it enter? Well, Romans 5 verse 12 answers that definitively and undeniably. Quote, as by one man, sin entered the world. Now remember, David said physical death existed as a part of the natural world before man, therefore before sin. As by one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Oh, wait a minute. Remember, David said physical death existed before man and before sin. Now, last night he denied he said that. Said he gave a paper denying that. Well, you know, if he's changed his mind, that's fine. David's done a flip-flop on several different topics during our two debates now. He's changed his position on Daniel chapter 12. He's changed his position on John 5. He's changed his position on this, that, and the other. So if David wants to recant what he said about death in the quote that I read to you, that's fine. In the first argument, Don is basically trying to link 1 Corinthians 15 to spiritual death as opposed to physical death, which is very important to his view because if 1 Corinthians 15 is referring to overcoming physical death, then the whole 80-70 doctrine comes crashing down. 
I will include my article about the resurrection again in the description below, which goes into great detail about 1 Corinthians 15, and it shows that it's talking about a physical resurrection and not a spiritual one. Let's watch David's response to Don's first argument. Now, as we begin, I'm glad to say that Don defined his proposition, which he is correct in saying he didn't do last year. I was halfway expecting him not to do it again this year. And yet he did, and for that I am appreciative. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, it does say that in the day thou shalt, that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die, or literally the Hebrew text says, dying you shall die. There was a death that day, a substitutionary death. Remember that God made animal skin coats and clothed both Adam and Eve. It is my conviction that that was not the only purpose for that death, that it was a substitutionary death in place of Adam and Eve that day, which also looked forward, if you remember Jesus or that God said, that the seed of uh, the woman, uh, that you shall bruise his heel, talking to the serpent, and he will crush your head. Veiled reference to Christ. And that ultimate victory over death would be accomplished with Jesus Christ. But there was a death that day in substitution for Adam and Eve. When they were in the Garden of Eden, before they sinned, they were in fellowship with God. And if they had eaten of the tree of life, they would have been able to live forever. And yet, because the woman hearkened to the voice of the serpent, and Adam did not do anything to uh, prohibit that from happening, they paid the penalty. They paid the penalty. And as a result, all of us die physically. We know that. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, he, brought, he told you know, that he brought up a chart twice last night and that I didn't answer it. Well, I didn't have to answer it for two reasons. One, because I was in the affirmative. And number two, he never answered my arguments from last night. Remember all those arguments that I made and he didn't answer any of them? Well, unless and until he answered those arguments, I was under no obligation to answer his. Well, he does mention about the questions that were submitted not this year for this debate, but last year for last year's debate and incorporates it in for this year's debate, which is a violation of the rules of this year's debate. But no, never mind. Look at what uh, he's talking about in connection with me, about the physical death and the spiritual death in the Garden of Eden. Well, the fact is... Physical death, as we know, was imposed upon Adam and his progeny. Notice carefully. Then to Adam he, God, said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall it bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Now this text, as we know, expresses a punishment for Adam that involves physical death. It implies that prior to this curse, he was not subject to it. On this day, he died spiritually and began to die physically because of his sin. The former attends us when we sin ourselves, while the latter is a curse that attends all of us. It is this aspect of God's punishment on Adam that Paul deals with in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22, that Christ came to set at naught, to rectify through the fact and the power of his own resurrection in the resurrection of the righteous dead. If it is the case that the death of 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, contemplated by the clause in Adam all die, is physical death, then the resurrection of the dead contemplated in the clause, in Christ all shall be made alive in that passage, is a literal resurrection out of physical death. It is the case that the death of 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, contemplated by that clause in Adam all die, is physical death. 
So the resurrection of the dead that's contemplated in the clause in Christ shall all be made alive in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 is a literal resurrection out of physical death. In Adam all die in verse 22 must refer to physical death. In Christ all are made alive must refer then to literal resurrection out of physical death. In other words, if that is not the case, then you've got Paul switching gears in midstream to those that whom he's talking in Corinth when he's making the argument which he's refuting their, some of their belief, some in the congregation, that there is no resurrection of the dead. That is, physical resurrection of the dead. I'm going to summarize the rest of Don's speech. Don argues in his second point that since Adam died spiritually in the garden, that Jesus also has to die spiritually on the cross. What I find interesting about this is that in the first night, we heard Don emphatically teach that Jesus did not die as a sinner. Yet here he's saying that Jesus died spiritually. How does spiritual death occur? Romans 6 verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul that sins shall die. You talk about flip-flopping, Don is contradicting himself. Don's third point is that Jesus was raised from the dead physically, but his physical resurrection was a sign of his spiritual resurrection. Then he uses the term first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15 to say that Jesus was the first to be resurrected spiritually and not physically. He argued that others had been raised physically before, which no one denies. Once again, Don is arguing that Jesus was dead spiritually, which means that he was a sinner. That is the only thing that can imply, regardless of how much Don says that it doesn't. While it is true that Jesus was not the first to be raised from physical death, he was the first to be physically raised to die no more. All those before him who were raised from the dead would die physically again, but not Jesus. That's what is different about his physical resurrection as opposed to the others before him. All Christians that have died are going to experience the same kind of physical resurrection Jesus had. Philippians 3 verses 20 through 21. I want you to think about what I'm about to say. Don has admitted that Jesus was raised physically from the dead. Not even he denies that. But when he admits that Jesus was physically raised from the dead, he destroys his argument because Don also understands that since Jesus was the first fruits, that we're going to be next and our resurrection is going to be like Jesus' resurrection. This is why Don has to say that Jesus' physical resurrection is a sign of his spiritual resurrection because if he doesn't turn it into a spiritual resurrection somehow, he knows his argument is gone. At some point, he might have to change his view and say that Jesus was not raised physically from the dead, but was raised spiritually, because that is the only way that he could say that the first fruits in 1 Corinthians 15 means that we would be raised spiritually. However, the simple truth of the matter is, is that Jesus was physically raised from the dead, and so will we. Even if we took Don's position, he would have to say, that since Jesus was raised physically to represent his spiritual death, then that would mean that we are going to be raised physically to represent our spiritual resurrection. If not, why not? However, the simple truth of the matter is that Jesus was raised from the dead physically, and so will we. Even if we took Don's position, would he not have to say that we too would have to be raised physically from the dead as Jesus was, but that it would only be a sign of us being spiritually raised? Why don't we just accept what the Bible teaches on this matter instead of trying to twist it to fit a spiritual resurrection? The first three arguments Don made are all linked to the idea of spiritual death instead of physical death. So when David dealt with that argument, he dealt with all three of these first three arguments put forth by Don. If you watch the debate, you'll see David deal with the physical death of Adam further in the speech. Don's fourth point has to do with when the resurrection would occur, and he ties it to Daniel chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, trying to show that it happened in AD 70. 
His main point is that Daniel is teaching that the resurrection would occur when the holy people were shattered, which he thinks is talking about the Jewish people and their destruction at AD 70. This is the only argument I did not hear David talk about in the debate, unless I missed it. But if you will look at my document on the resurrection in the description below, you'll see that I talk about Daniel chapter 12 and its various views. One thing I want to mention at this point that I think is important is that just about any false doctrine can present things from the Bible that sound like they support their doctrine when it really does not once you see the big picture. Let me give you two examples. If you ever started having some symptoms that you never had before, such as a racing heart or feeling faint, you might go to the internet and you might start investigating your symptoms. The problem with doing this is that there are a multitude of diseases that will have your symptoms. Now, if you base everything on a few conditions that that disease can present, then you're going to think for sure that you have this nasty disease that you're looking at. However, when you go to the doctor and they start checking you out, you may find out that you have nothing more than a virus or something that is not fatal. In the same way, you can find things within the false doctrine such as 8070 and say, wow, that sure sounds like it fits pretty well. But upon further investigation, when you look at all the evidence, false doctrines such as AD 70 and the rest will fall. My second example is a puzzle. I'm sure we've all put a puzzle together at some point in our lives. Sometimes you will find a piece that looks like it fits. The cutout is almost the same, and with a little bit of force, you might even make it fit in that slot. However, as you continue putting the puzzle together, you will soon find out that you have that piece in the wrong place, and then you'll find the right place that it goes. And you can only figure this out once you have put all the pieces together. Now, if you're trying to put a puzzle together that you have no idea what the picture of it's going to be, and you begin to see an ear that looks like a cat's ear, you might be convinced that, there, that that must be a cat within that picture. But once you finish the puzzle, you now know that it wasn't a cat's ear at all. It was a trimmed dog's ear. We have to be careful as we examine topics such as the resurrection and Jesus coming to make sure that we look at all the pieces of the puzzle to see what the final picture is going to be. We cannot just hold a few pieces of the puzzle and say, well, this must mean this. I think this is the problem with those who hold the AD 70 view. They have a few pieces of the puzzle that look like they fit, even if they have to force them, and then they stop there. They don't finish putting the puzzle together because they don't want to see the full picture. They just want to hold on to those few pieces that give them the illusion that their doctrine is right. Don's fifth argument is related to a chart he brought up twice in the first night of the debate when he was supposed to be in the negative. This chart has to do with the destruction of Satan and the last enemy. He complained that David did not deal with the chart in the first debate. But David had no obligation to deal with this chart while in the affirmative because Don was introducing an affirmative argument. Had Don not wasted time doing this, then maybe he could have had time to answer more than just three out of the 14 arguments he touched on in the first night of the debate. Don tries to tie Romans 16 and verse 20 to all of this with time statements such as shortly and other various scriptures that talk about things being near. Of course, all of these things happened in AD 70, according to Don. Now think about this. If Don is correct that Satan has been destroyed, which would mean that he is no longer walking about like a roaring lion, then we can see that we don't have a problem with the devil anymore. Don also applies the enemy in 1 Corinthians 15 as being spiritual death and says that spiritual death was taken care of in AD 70. If that is the case, then not only is there no more devil, there can be no more sin because if spiritual death has been taken care of, we no longer can be separated from God. If not, why not? This is why the AD 70 doctrine logically ends in universalism.
Now let's listen to Don's summary of his first speech. One thing that Don emphasized was the time statements that says at hand or something similar. So let's see what David says about this. Now he talks about at hand or not at hand. When the Bible affirms that a particular event is at hand in one text and yet declares it not at hand in a text of the same approximate date, or after the text stating it is at hand, which we have, such as in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, then it must be viewing the event from two distinct time perspectives. It is quite common in the Old Testament prophecies for at hand text to entail a prophecy of an event, yet centuries in fulfillment from the time perspective of the prophet. A striking example of this is in Isaiah 56, 1, where Jehovah proclaimed that his salvation was then nigh at hand. The prophecy concerned the coming of Christ and his atoning work at Calvary. It was several centuries in the future from Isaiah's day. The full preterist heresy can't account for this, except by the absurd idea that was invented out of whole cloth of projected eminence. Instead of taking God at his word on the matter, some contend that at some point in the future it would become at hand despite the fact the specific construction in the Hebrew and Septuagint Greek text involve a stative condition then existing at the time of the prophet. The simple grammar structure exposes the failure of full preterism in the matter of languages and in the desperation of their quibbles to avoid that which is obvious. When some are tempted, as Don seems to be, to carp against the idea of, uh, of at-hand statements in prophecy, sometimes involving centuries before fulfillment, and actually claiming that God could not and thus never would do so, they need to stop and ask themselves the following questions. Number one, does God have the ability to have done so? Number two, would God have been deceitful 
in doing so. Number three, was God deceitful when he spoke of certain events not only as near, but as actually having already come to pass when they were in linear time, yet future in fulfillment? Number four, was God deceitful when he prophesied of Jesus' birth as though it had already occurred, much less being near, in Isaiah 9, 6? Will you accuse people? of teaching that God can't tell time because they believe of Isaiah, the prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6 refers to Jesus Christ. And then, do you believe that Isaiah 9, 6, which speaks of a birth that has already occurred, is not really a prophecy of a then future event? If it is the case that the inspired word of God teaches the second coming of Christ is at hand and yet not at hand, it must be the case the word of God is using the phrase at hand in two differing senses. It is the case the inspired word of God teaches that the second coming of Christ is at hand and yet not at hand, so it must be the case that the word of God is using the phrase at hand in two different senses. If the Bible teaches that God tempts man and that he does not tempt man, then if the Bible teaches that we are saved by works and yet we are not saved by works, then if the Bible teaches that Satan is a God but yet is, it teaches that he is not a God, then what we're talking about is the fact that at hand, an event can be spoken of as being at hand from God's perspective, how God views the event from his own timelessness and yet not at hand from man's perspective, which is limited and which is linear in nature. Time statements have to be looked at within their given context. Just because at hand can be used to show something that will happen soon in some places, as David pointed out, it can refer to things that happen hundreds of years later. So at hand simply expresses the idea that a thing will happen, which can be quickly or much later. One of the problems with the AD 70 doctrine is that it tries to force all time statements to mean exactly the same thing regardless of the context. But you cannot do that. Context is king. I want to share a little bit more of David's negative that I thought was really good. Was the church dead until AD 70? Since life begins at the moment of conception, the church existed from the time of conception. Therefore, it existed before AD 70. But if it was not resurrected from the grave until AD 70, then the church was dead. No life, no conception before AD 70. How could an unconceived, dead church have life before it was raised to life? Are there any unconquered enemies? Don and his disciples look at the world and see no unconquered enemy, not even one thought which has not been brought into captivity to Christ. All our enemies and all of God's enemies, according to their doctrine, have already been conquered. Not a one of them is unbound. Think about it. How wonderful it must be to live at a time when it is impossible for a thought to get unbound and misrepresent anyone. This is a time when all thinking must be scripturally correct thinking, for it must be a world in which every thought has already been brought into captivity to Christ. I am right. Don is right. His disciples are right. You are all right. Everyone is right. Let's all link arms and sing kumbaya and sing joy to the world. Isn't it too wonderful for words? How ludicrous is this position? I hate to cut David off right here, but you need to watch the debate for yourself because David goes on to make many more good arguments against the AD 70 doctrine. He also points out all the arguments that Don did not answer from the first night, which was almost all of them. While David did not answer all of Don's arguments, from the best I can tell, he answered most of them. In fact, there was only one argument about Daniel chapter 12 that he did not deal with. Now, if you want to compare, Don really has no room to complain after only answering three out of the 14 arguments that David made the night before. Next, Don begins his second speech and you will see that he begins to get very frustrated. He is upset that David did not deal with his arguments to his liking, yet he had no problem not answering the majority of David's argument the night before. That's what you call a dual standard. This is going to be another longer clip of Don, but it's necessary in order for you to be able to see his complete rant and also to get enough context to understand his argument. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me say before I get directly into my affirmative, and I'll say this as kindly as I know how, in all of my years of debating, and I've had a multitude of debates, 
I have never encountered a worse presentation from a debate opponent in my entire life. You know, folks, David got up there and said, well, if Preston, if Preston is true, then this is true. But did you notice he didn't prove one single argument? All he did was assert. And by the way, he said he's supposed to be in the negative. He's supposed to follow my arguments. I made four arguments which he didn't address. Well, he did say a few things about time, which is some of the most convoluted, self-destructive, confusing argumentation. In other words, what David really wants you to believe, folks, is that God can't tell time or God refuses to tell time properly and accurately. He talks about God's talking about his time and God talking about man's time. Well, I want to tell you something. And I've got to get into my affirmative here. Rubel Shelley said, man cannot understand God's language because there's God talk and then there is man talk and man cannot understand God's word. And you know what? That's exactly what David Hester tried to convince you of. Man cannot understand God's time words. And you know how David responded to, to Rubel Shelley? Well, you know, Rubel Shelley is one of David's favorite people, right, David? <laughs> And so David Shelley, excuse me, David Hester said that doctrine and that statement is absolutely false. There are multitudes of passages in the Bible that shows that man cannot or can understand God and must understand God. So everything that David said about time statements not being understandable because they're God's talk, guess what? Rubel Shelley would agree with that. And now David Hester has joined Rubel Shelley in saying, can't understand God's word. Well, okay. Oh, but one more thing. He said, I violated the rules of debate by bringing up material from last week or from last year. I uh, tell you what, Brother Wages, if you can find that rule in the debate and read it to me, I will apologize to Brother Hester. David, you know that's not true. You know it's not in the rules. You know it's the truth. No, look, you, there was nothing. Don't interrupt, by the way. Do not interrupt me. Brother David Hester knows without a shadow of a doubt, there's not one word in our rules that forbids me to go back and to discuss anything that we have discussed in previous discussions. Now, if it is, I'll apologize. But I sure don't remember reading that. Now to my affirmative. All right. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, quote, It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who are troubling you and to give to you who are being troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who know not God and that do, know, do not obey the gospel who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Now, here are some absolutely indisputable facts. It's just humorous to me, but it's also kind of sad, that David keeps talking about my Humpty Dumpty hermeneutic. Let's talk about hermeneutic in this lesson, ladies and gentlemen. And let me present to you some indisputable hermeneutical facts. Point number one, Paul was writing to Thessalonian Christians who lived 2,000 years ago. That's right, isn't it? They were being persecuted for their faith. Right or wrong, David. And they were being persecuted by the Jews. Now I'll get to that. Number two, Paul promised those living, breathing Thessalonian Christians relief from that then ongoing persecution. And he promised that their persecutors would be cast out of the presence of the Lord. And Paul promised, point number four, that the judgment of their persecutors and relief from that persecution would be, quote, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Now look, folks, these facts are absolutely beyond dispute unless David wants to dispute that he's writing to Thessalonians. Paul was writing to Thessalonians. Language could not be clearer. Now I want you to follow me very carefully. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 14 to 16, Paul said, You, brethren, who is that church at Thessalonica, became imitators of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. You also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. They do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved, so as always fill up the measure of their sins, 
but the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. Now, I want you to look at the comparative chart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is written to the same identical church. That same church was undergoing then present persecution. It was Jewish persecution. Again, more about that momentarily. And in both passages, there is the promise of imminent vindication, imminent judgment of their persecutors. And it would be at Christ's coming against their persecutors. Matthew 23 and 24, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now watch this, folks. Paul's writing to the same church. That's undeniable. It's the same identical persecution. It's undeniable. They are the same persecutors, unless David can prove otherwise. And it's the same identical promise of vindication and judgment of their persecutors. And that promise was that they, living 2,000 years ago, would receive relief, quote, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Now, I want to know David's hermeneutic for denying this. David got up here and talked, said, I redefined all these words. You know, he didn't prove one thing. I'm absolutely amazed at David's assertions for which he offered no proof whatsoever. None, not a word. Did he go to a single text and exegete it? No, didn't touch it. And by the way, it has been my experience over the years that about the only thing the enemies of covenant eschatology can do is misrepresent what we believe. That's all David did. He said, Preston says they're waiting for the Jewish age. I, I've never said that. I've never taught that. David, I don't know where in the world you ever got that. If you'd actually read what we teach and, uh, and write, you would know that you grossly misrepresented what I said and what I say. All right, let's go on. Here's my argument. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 to 16 and 2 Thessalonians were both written to the same church about the same issue and made the same promise, eminent vindication, Imminent judgment, imminent relief. But 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 to 16 predicted the AD 70 judgment of Israel for persecuting the first century church. You know, unless David wants to argue that, that 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is somehow God's words that don't mean anything whatsoever, it could be talking about the judgment of those persecutors a gazillion years from then. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 to 16 predicted the AD 70 judgment of Israel for persecuting the first century church. Therefore, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, being the, being the identical persecution, the identical persecutors, and the identical promise of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, two predicted the AD 70 judgment of Israel for, for, for persecuting the first century church. Folks, here's Paul's promise. Paul promised those living, breathing Thessalonian Christians who are being persecuted for their faith that they... Paul was not writing to a church 2,000 years after the Thessalonians. He was writing to the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago, and he said that they would, re, would be given relief from that persecution at the coming of the Lord. Now, the word for relief there, or rest, is onesis. Onesis is never used as reward or heaven. When used with the Greek word thalipsis, which is the word that is translated as troubled in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, anesis is invariably relief from whatever pressure is being experienced. It can be financial pressure. It can be the pressure of childbirth. But anesis is invariably relief from whatever pressure is being experienced. Now, they were, they were suffering... Not the normal pressure of the human experience, as David says on Romans chapter 8. No, they were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. That means that they were being given pr the promise of relief from that persecution. Now watch this. When would that relief come? Okay, I forgot I did that. Okay. All right. Listen to me again. David, this is hermeneutic 101. Paul was writing to living Christians who were alive 2,000 years ago. Now, if you want to deny that, let's just have some fun with it, okay? Those Christians living 2,000 years ago were being persecuted for their faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 was not talking about the church at the East Meadow Church of Christ in Montgomery, Alabama. 
He was writing to a church 2,000 years ago. And Paul promised those living saints that they would receive relief from that then ongoing persecution. And that relief would be, quote, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Now, you know, I don't know what I did there, but uh, anyway, let me try this. Ladies and gentlemen, any hermeneutic that denies that Paul was writing to Christians 2,000 years ago, any hermeneutic that denies that they were being persecuted, any hermeneutic that denies that they were given the promise of relief from that persecution is a false hermeneutic. I want David to answer the following question. Did Christ come, give those suffering Thessalonians relief from that then ongoing persecution at the hands of their fellow countrymen? Yes or no? Don't fail to answer that question. Now look at Paul's promise. Paul was speaking of relief from that persecution. Once again, relief is from anesis or rest. And it would come when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Now notice what Paul did not say. He did not say that that relief would come before the coming. He did not say it would come without the Lord coming. He did not say, you know, you're going to die. Oh, hey, maybe you might even be killed and go to Abraham's bosom. No. He said they would receive relief when the Lord Jesus is, re is revealed from heaven. Now watch this. The Thessalonians had to be alive, being persecuted for Christ to give them relief from that persecution when he came. It's unavoidable. That's hermeneutic, folks. And it's not Humpty Dumpty. But I tell you what, it breaks David Hester's hermeneutic in pieces and it can't be put back together again. I had to stop the video right here because the rest of his speech continues on with the same argument. So I encourage you to watch the rest of it. Now please listen to David's answer to the argument that Don made. He spent a lot of time talking about 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, it says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Question, is there any hint in this passage that is allegorical? Not one. If language is to mean anything, if context is to mean anything, then we must assume because of the way that Paul writes, and Paul was a very educated man. You know, he could express himself clearly and did that this is the second coming of Jesus Christ that is under contemplation here. Question, where in all of the events that took place in AD 70 in Jerusalem was the Lord himself descending from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Now, Don will say it's allegorical. In essence, he may not say it explicitly, but he'll claim that it represents something. Well, where is the hint in the passage where it represents something? That we are not to take this at face value. You know, he talks about me being like Rubel Shelley. That's the second time he's compared me to Rubel Shelley. I have no idea what in the world he's talking about. You know, I have no clue what he's referring to. I remember last year in the debate when I was with... Uh, 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 Phil Sanders, who was my moderator in that debate, he said, David is Rubel Shelley. I turned to him and said, did he just say I'm Rubel Shelley? He said, I think he did. But he's saying that again for some reason this year. I guess he thinks I'm a pointy-headed academic. I don't know. But anyway, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ, I suppose that's the spiritual dead, I suppose that's metaphorical or allegorical. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now let him try to prove that that's allegorical. Christ and the holy angels, were they represented by Titus and the Roman soldiers? I assume that's what we are to believe. 
But yet Christ is to come literally. Acts 1, 11. This same Jesus, whom you saw ascend into heaven, he shall come in like manner as you have seen him go up into heaven. Can you understand that? I don't think you have to have a PhD to understand it. I don't even think you have to have a master's or bachelor's degree to understand that. All you've got to do is read the text for what it states. He shall come in like manner in the same way as you have seen him go up in heaven. When did that happen in 8070, the destruction of Jerusalem? He is to come with the clouds of heaven. Titus came from Rome. He didn't come from the clouds of heaven. Titus came from Rome. And in fact, if you remember, Vespasian began that siege and was called back to Rome because of the chaos in the city. And Titus took his place and finished that siege. Was Titus Christ? Apparently we are to believe he's the representative of Christ. But we know he is not literally Christ and there's no indication that he was indicated as such in Scripture. He shall come with all the holy angels. Matthew 25, 31. Jesus was not to come with wicked, bloodthirsty soldiers. Where is the indication where the wicked, bloodthirsty soldiers of Rome were the holy angels? He is to come in flaming fire. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. All the fire that happened in Jerusalem was after Titus came. And yet we're to believe that that Fire is what Paul was talking about. He shall come upon the wicked unawares. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3. Jesus was apprised the intentions of the Romans and made preparations for their attack. They were not saying peace and safety. Did Christ in the person of Titus convince all the ungodly Jews? Remember that argument I made last night that he didn't touch? along with all the other arguments that he was obligated to answer and did not touch, but he will probably do so over the next year on, or try to do so on his morning musings. Well, he didn't touch it. He didn't answer it. He didn't respond to it. He was in the obligation to do that last night and did not. Was Jesus revealed from heaven in AD 70? Was he revealed in flaming fire in AD 70? Was he revealed with his mighty angels? He'll say, oh, we know from the Old Testament that uh, things represent things and, and uh, oh, God is represented by his instruments of war. Where is the indication that Titus would be the representative of Christ? Nowhere. The Jews were the ones persecuting the Thessalonians. Were these the Jews of Jerusalem? Or were they from somewhere else? In verse 10 of that passage, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. 2 Thessalonians 1.10. Read the passage in 2 Thessalonians 1 and tell me again that this does not refer to the second coming. Read it. To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven not from Rome, with his mighty angels, not the Roman soldiers, in flaming fire, not the fires of Jerusalem, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with what? Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Does that read to you like a second cousin to the destruction of Jerusalem? Or does it read like the second coming of Christ? and the final judgment that will take place against the just or against the, the unjust and for those who are just. How did the destruction of the Jews at Jerusalem relieve the Thessalonians? Were the Jews of Jerusalem, the Jews persecuting the Christians at that city? Was the Lord or was it Titus who was revealed? You know, he had a lot to say about my hermeneutical approach. He had a lot of aspersions to cast. But friends, I'll let you be the judge as to whether he's being fair with Scripture. I'll let you be the judge as to whether he is applying allegory all the way around and his allegorical merry-go-round and only he can determine what is allegorical and what's not or will it be the Scripture that determines it. Do you remember how I said you need to look at all the pieces of the puzzle to get the complete picture? Well, Don was holding that one piece of the puzzle and he wanted you to think that the relief that was being spoken of to them would happen in their lifetime. And it would happen when Jesus returned by means of the Roman army to destroy Jerusalem. I would like to know the same thing that David wanted to know. How would destroying Jerusalem bring relief to the Christians in Thessalonica when they were over 900 miles away from Jerusalem as a crow flies? As David pointed out, the language used in this chapter only fits with the final judgment and visible coming of Jesus. 
the fact that Paul said, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, indicates that when Jesus comes, that it won't be just about them, but about us, which could include Paul and those with him, and all Christians as far as that goes. What better event can there be where the faithful will receive rest and those who oppose God will receive His wrath than the final judgment day? We can see that the angels will be involved with the coming just as the parable of the tares and wheat describes in Matthew chapter 13 where the angels do the separating of the righteous and the unrighteous. We know this didn't happen in A.D. 70, but it will happen when Jesus comes again. We don't have to stop there. David used the text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to show that when Jesus comes, we will meet him in the air, which didn't happen in A.D. 70. Also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul indicates that there were some who were teaching that Jesus had already came. And he wants them to understand that Jesus' coming was not going to happen anytime soon because there had to be a falling away from the faith. And then the man of sin had to be revealed. In fact, let me read a few of those verses. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. I know there are different ideas about who the man of sin is, but that doesn't matter for this point, because whoever the man of sin was, he was at work, but not yet revealed, according to verse 7. He also had to be someone who came out of Christianity from the falling away, which excludes Judaism since they rejected Christianity and were never part of it. Everyone knew what Judaism was, so Judaism could not be that which is revealed at a later date. Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians around A.D. 51, and there was no great falling away from the faith between A.D. 51 and A.D. 70. The falling away didn't happen until centuries later. When you consider all the pieces of the puzzle, you can clearly see the complete picture. Paul was not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in these verses that Don was using because Paul was talking about things that were not going to happen anytime soon. But when they did happen, it would be on a day, which is the final judgment day, when Jesus will come again visibly and with a great noise and with his angels. I hope you have found this review helpful. Everything I've said is what I got out of the debate and what I believe the scriptures teach. I want to encourage you to watch the debate in full and take notes. Check out the verses that are used on both sides and make your own decision. I wish men like Don would stop trying to split the church over this doctrine, which is not supported by the Bible. Don said himself that he wished we could be unified, but this doctrine he teaches just splits churches. So I think it's a dangerous doctrine that promotes division, not unity. You can say I'm biased if you want, but I honestly think that David did a great job of teaching what the scriptures teach, and I hope he has many more years of service in the kingdom. Like I did with my review on the first night, I will close with the last two speeches. Let me summarize my affirmatives this evening, and to a certain extent, my, uh, this debate. And contrary to what David said, that I would introduce new arguments, no, I'm just going to summarize what I've said because what I've said is more than sufficient to prove my affirmatives. Number one, I have demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 would be to overcome the death introduced by Adam the day he sinned. I prove from David's own pens, David's own keystrokes, that physical death did in indeed exist before they sinned. Now, David said that Adam and Eve began to die. They began to die. Now, I want you to notice the double talk here, or the double interpretation is the better uh, way to express that. David believes that Adam and Eve did die that very day. They were separated from God that very day, but then it took them 900 years to die physically. Physically. 
And David says, well, you see what happened here is that God made a substitutionary animal sacrifice. That substitutionary animal sacrifice did not prevent their spiritual death for even one moment. What kind of a substitutionary death is that? Furthermore, what's interesting is that substitutionary animal sacrifice prevented their physical death for 900 years. So it was more effective physically than it was spiritually. Now watch this. I presented two charts last night on the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Let's apply David's application of Genesis and the substitutionary death of those animals, okay? On the one hand, the substitutionary death of those animals prevented their death, extended their life for 900 years. But Jesus' substitutionary physical death doesn't even prolong your physical life or mine even 10 years. We're not even guaranteed 100. You mean to tell me that that substitutionary animal sacrifice was more effective to bring physical life for Adam and Eve, giving them 900 years, but the substitutionary physical death of Jesus doesn't even extend our life for 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 100? What does that say about the efficacy of Jesus' sacrifice? Furthermore, that physical, that physical animal sacrifice was not effective in preventing their spiritual death because they died that very day. Well, guess what? According to David, you and I do not have eternal life today because in our first debate, yes, I have the right to do that, and I even pointed out in this debate, according to David Hester, when the faithful child of God dies today, they don't get to go to heaven. They're still kicked out of the garden. And they don't get to go to heaven, the most holy place, until the power of the holy people, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is shattered. You notice I made that argument and David just breezed right over it. Didn't it well, he didn't breeze over it. He did more than the Passover on it. He didn't even touch it. Okay, so here we have the death of Jesus, which is less effective than the animal sacrifice. Now, let's go back to this. He said, in the day you eat. Now, I pointed out they had to die that very day. Let me give you some corroborative evidence from world-renowned Hebrew scholars who reject David's claim that, that Hebrew, excuse me, Genesis 2, 15, 17 means about to die. Rayburn and Fry say that in the day that you eat of it is literally for on the day of your eating from it, that is, the very day you eat from it, or straightway, you shall die is the same Hebrew double verb construction as is translated freely. Eat in verse 16. And here the meaning is, you will certainly die. You will die for sure. The emphatic statement, which is the infinitive absolute in the Hebrew, may also be translated as, you will die the day you eat it. Now, by the way, I've been in correspondence with a man who's widely considered to be one of the greatest Hebraists in the world today. He lives in, in Israel. And I contacted him, and he corroborated that meaning. David's just simply wrong. They didn't begin to die that day. God said, end the day. And by the way, you know, God said, you will die? And David says, well, you know, uh, an animal die." It's not what God said, is it? Well, let's go on. And uh, yeah, here we are. I, I, I pointed out that Christ was the first to be raised from the dead. David didn't touch it. He didn't breathe on it. I pointed out that the time words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, tagmati, epita, and ita are temporal indicators of order of occurrence. Order of occurrence means that Christ was the first to be raised from the dead. Now that answers David's argument that the resurrection had to be a physical bodily resurrection because Christ was the first to be raised from the dead. But he was not the first to be raised from physical death. Therefore, physical death is not the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15. I made that point over and over, and yet David stands up and says, Well, you know, Don didn't answer my... My argument about the bodily resurrection. Yes, I did. He just simply ignored it. 
Scripture posited the resurrection at the end of the old covenant age, Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. And remember, yeah, David has changed his view back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until finally settling on the view that the resurrection will be when the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation, which Jesus Christ himself said will never pass away, but, da but David applies Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7 to the time when the gospel will be completely shattered. Folks, did, do you remember what I pointed out last night? David says, second coming will be at the end of the gospel age. The Bible affirms the gospel age has no end. See, that, that gets back to David's misrepresentation when he got up there and said, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages unto the Jewish age. I don't believe anything close to that. It's just a blatant mis misrepresentation of what I believe. David should not be making comments like that. And as I pointed out, the Bible says hundreds of times that the coming of the Lord was at hand. The God of heaven who knew the day and the hour sent and signified to his servants. That's to man. God was talking to man and said to man, these things must shortly come to pass. Oh, by the way, and it's literally the appointed time. He appealed to Acts chapter 17, and I, I addressed Acts chapter 17 last night. Now watch this, Acts 17, he is appointed a day. Okay, that's fine. The appointed time for the judgment has arrived. 1 Peter chapter 4, and David has to agree that 1 Peter 4 referred to AD 70. So here is the appointed time for the judgment, the judgment of the living and the dead. Here is Peter saying the time had come for the judgment of the living and the dead. And all of a sudden, David wants to jump up and says, well, Don seems to think that just because it's similarity of judgment or similarity of language, they're the same. Well, I challenged him in the first debate. Show me where there are more than one judgments of the living and the dead in Scripture. Secondly, uh, okay, oh, oh, sorry about that. I prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. And yeah, here we're talking about her hermeneutic. I asked David, was Paul writing to the first century Thessalonian church 2,000 years ago? You notice he didn't deny it. He agreed. They were being persecuted for their, by their fellow countrymen. He didn't deny that. Paul promised those living, breathing Thessalonians who were alive 2,000 years ago relief from that persecution. And David says, well, how would the destruction of Jerusalem affect them? That's a long way away. Well, for the same reason that Paul had letters of authority to persecute Christians all the way up in Damascus, hundreds of miles away, and it's because Jews throughout the Roman Empire were empowered by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. You destroy the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, you've destroyed the head of the persecuting snake. That's how it happened. And because in the Jewish war, the Jews became the object, just like 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says they would be, they became the object of persecution when the Romans turned on them. And I asked David, do you notice he didn't breathe on it? Did Jesus come in the lifetime of the first century saints at Thessalonica and give them relief from that persecution, yes or no? Paul promised them relief. He wasn't speaking to a generation hundreds and thousands of years removed. David did not touch it. Now, you talk about bringing up new arguments. Let's see if David makes some new arguments in violation of all rules and protocol of debate. Folks, he's got to deal with proper hermeneutic. Once again, David stood up here and gave a lot of really what could be in, uh, construed as inflammatory language about how destructive and how, uh, you know, disruptive covenant eschatology is and it splits churches. You do, know, don't, you do know, don't you folks, that the same accusations were made against Alexander Campbell and the members of the Restoration Movement, how they split churches far and wide. What kind of an argument is that? That's an ad hominem emotional argument that has no validity whatsoever. It proves nothing whatsoever. Now, let me address the question that I brought up, uh, the issue that I brought up last night. He brought up the issue of two laws. I addressed that, <clears throat> and I addressed Acts chapter 21. How James said, 
There are many myriads. There are thousands of Jews who believe. Did you notice that when, when David got up here, he just kind of brushed right past who believe? And he said, they were just Jews. Well, no, David. There were Jewish Christians who were observing the law, who were zealous for the law. And James told Paul, hey, Paul, These brethren, these believing Christian Jews are hearing that you teach against the law. Here's what we want you to do in order to prove that that is wrong. Paul says, I'm cool with that. No problem whatsoever. Now, again, I pointed out last night, David might say that's expediency, but it's not expediency because Paul said that the Gentiles could not do this. No, it's not expediency. Now, as to the two laws... Could there be two laws existing side by side? Well, watch this. Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until it's all fulfilled. I pointed out to you last night that the Sabbaths were part of the law. David understands that. The Sabbaths foreshadowed the resurrection. The feast days or the the Sabbaths and the feast days foreshadowed the resurrection and the coming of the Lord and the judgment. Those feast days, the Sabbaths, the new moons, Judgment had not been fulfilled when Paul wrote Hebrews. You got that? They could not pass until what they foreshadowed came to a reality. So here is Paul talking about the new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths that were present, active, indicative, Colossians chapter 2. By the way, Colossians doesn't say the law was nailed to the cross. It says the handwriting of debt was nailed to the cross. David ought to know that. It's the same as saying their, their sins were forgiven. But look, look at this. Those new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths foreshadowed the eschatological consummation. They foreshadowed the judgment and the resurrection. They were still shadows when Paul wrote Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. They are present, active, indicative, shadows of good things that are about to come. Hebrews chapter 10, the law having present, active, indicative, a shadow of things that are about to come. They could not pass until what they foreshadowed came to pass. In other words, the feast days would stand valid. Hebrews chapter 9, 6 to 10. As long as that first tabernacle had validity, there was no access because what they foreshadowed had not come to pass. In other words, they had no salvation until the feast days, the Sabbaths, were fulfilled. Guess what? David says, Hebrews 4, 10, 4, 10. A Sabbath rest remains. Well, folks, if a Sabbath rest remains, that means the old law is still in effect today. So what have we done? I have demonstrated to you in every possible way that David's basic hermeneutic is false. He's talked a lot lot about allegory. I've demonstrated that texts do not always tell us if they're allegory. We have to be familiar with Hebrew, Hebraic, apocalyptic language. And it's high time for David, it's high time for us all to become familiar with that. When David says, did Titus represent Jesus? I shared with you last night that Sargon represented Yahweh, Isaiah 19 and 20. David never answered it. I shared with you last night that Nebuchadnezzar, represented Yahweh, Isaiah, or excuse me, Jeremiah 29 to 32. David did not touch that. I pointed out to you the Assyrians represented Yahweh. He didn't touch it. I'm out of time. Thank you again for your wonderful attention. You know, I wonder if Don believes that he will appear before the judgment seat of Christ based on what he has said. I assume he does not believe he will uh, because of what he has said in his arguments, but I just wonder... You know, death was introduced to the human race by Adam's sin. The ultimate sacrifice of Jesus was alluded to in the prophecy of the seed of the woman crushing the seed of the serpent. I believe all of us know that that is referring to Christ and how He would crush the seed of the serpent. You know, Adam ceased to be what God originally created when he sinned. He was created perfect. And yet, he ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I don't know what kind of fruit it was. It was fruit. 
after Eve had given in to temptation, she was tempted to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Just as the book of 1 John declares, just as Jesus was tempted, she was tempted in like manner. And she succumbed and ate and then gave to her husband who was with her and he did eat. Now the text in the Hebrew states, And the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Or Hebrew, literally, dying, you shall die. Now we know they did not die an immediate physical death, but there was a death, as much as Don doesn't want to admit it, there was a death that day. And it was those animals who God killed to make coats of skins to clothe both Adam and Eve. And I contend that there was a sacrifice made that day. All throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, we read about blood sacrifice being offered on behalf of man's sin. And I believe that was the case at that point, that there was a sacrifice made. And he says, well, they lived 900 plus years, so it wasn't effective enough. Or that is to say that we are less effective today than they had it then. Well, we know for a fact that the flood, the global flood of Noah's day, changed the world. The world that then was perished. It's no more. But the world that is now, Peter says, is reserved unto judgment. The world physically was changed. It was radically changed. And so after the, the flood of Noah, you see that the life expectancy of man drops precipitously until we read the wise man saying that if you live to 70 years, you're living a, a long life. That was in, this, in, the, pro, in the, uh, the, the psalmist's day or the wise man's day. That they would have lived to 70 years old, you'd live a long life. And compared to Adam, Adam lived 900 plus years. Methuselah, 969. And yet in just a short period of time, that rate drops down to where it pretty much is today. Well, the fact is, there was a death then. Dying you shall die, satisfied by the substitute sacrifice that God made for them. Christ was the first to be raised, never to die again. That's fact. If he died spiritually, as we pointed out very meticulously last night, if Christ died spiritually, he died out of fellowship with God. Yes, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a direct quotation from Psalms 22. But that direct quotation from Psalms 22 refers to a passage that declares the superiority of God and that God is over all and that He is triumphant. It is a great messianic prophecy concerning the specifics of Jesus' death. Jesus, of course, prayed on, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane that this cup would pass from Him, not the cup of death. He was determined to die. That was the Father's will. He did not want to suffer what crucifixion had in store and all the beatings. And he knew what he would go through. That's, not, that's what he did not want to suffer. But yet, when he said at his death, into your hands, I commend my spirit, that indicates a man who was not out of fellowship with God. I submit to you, he did not die spiritually separated from God. If he had he would have been a sinner. Don did not like that conclusion, but what other conclusion can we draw? He wants to confuse dying out of fellowship with God as dying, uh, as far as dying a substitutionary death. There's two different things, two different things that are involved there. Uh, did Christ literally, visibly, and personally come to Thessalonica? You know, we affirmed last night that when Christ comes again, He will come literally, visibly, and personally. As He came or as He ascended, He'll come as He ascended in Acts chapter 1 as the angels declared to the apostles. And yet we are to believe that Christ actually came to Thessalonica as He claims, as Don claims that He did to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 21, did James' advice work? that he gave to Paul? I don't think anyone would claim that it worked. It didn't work. In fact, it led to even more problems. Now, here's another question to consider. Did Paul violate his teaching in Acts 21? In, uh, that is, that he did. The, well, did he violate his teaching by what he did in Acts 21 back in Galatians 5? Galatians 5 declares that if you uh, uh, go back to the law of Moses 
that you've fallen from grace. You've literally given up grace. In Acts 21, did he violate that? I don't think he did. If he did, as we are led to believe here, then Paul had fallen from grace, as well as James, as well as the Jerusalem church. And not only that, they were guilty of hypocrisy of the highest rank. You know, I wonder, was any of the law of Moses done away with at the cross? Apparently, Don believes that it was not. And as a result, Galatians is simply meaningless. Galatians 5 means absolutely nothing. Now, my hearing is not nearly as good as it used to be. I am getting older. I won't tell you how old. You may say, well, you're still a young whippersnapper. Well, still, the fact is I'm getting older, and the reality is hearing gets a little bit more dense. But I think I heard Don say that the old law is still in effect today. The old law is still in effect today. Now, maybe that was a misstatement. But I believe that's what he said. We can go back to the tape and see. And go to the transcript when it comes out and see if he said it. Is the old law still in effect today? I'll leave it to you to answer that question. Apocalyptic language is not allegory. They're two different things. I think Don knows that. And yet we're to believe that apocalyptic language and allegorical language are one and the same? No. No, no. A thousand times no. Apocalyptic language is what it is. Allegorical language is what it is. Apocalyptic language is symbolic, yes. Revelation is an apocalypsis. It is an apocalypse. And yes, the symbols such as the beast, the bottomless pit, and other symbols, represent something. But unless the language of Scripture demands that something be interpreted symbolically, then who are we to do that? It's quite obvious Revelation was written in signs. John says that at the outset of the book. It is quite obvious that when Paul talks about the allegory of Hagar, that it is an allegory. But unless and until Scripture states it, and explains it clearly, then I'm not going to sit in the shoes of inspired men and say that it is when it isn't. Sargon, Nebuchadnezzar, the Assyrians were identified by God as his representatives. Catch that? They were identified by God as his representatives. Where is the passage? Where is the indication? from God directly that Titus and the Roman soldiers were in the place of Christ and the holy angels. Nowhere. You can't find it. Now Don assumes it when he sees that Christ is coming, the holy angels. That's Titus. That's the Roman soldiers. Where is that indicated? He goes to Matthew 24 about the destruction of Jerusalem and tries to tie it in. But no, two different things. Two different things indeed. You have to assume that this is the case with no evidence of Scripture to prove it. You know, spiritually alive people will die physically, be buried physically, and then raised spiritually. With what body? A spiritual body, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But a body is to be raised, 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Anyone that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. 8070 teaching, Don's doctrine has no hope. It's bereft of the hope that we read about in Romans. You know, he got up here and he wanted to say, well, you know, the divisions that have taken place you know, have no bearing on this. Well, I think it has bearing on the brethren who've suffered through it. I think it has bearing on the families that have suffered through it, the families that I've talked to that are affected directly by this division, by these doctrines that have been pushed. And I think about men who have gone on before us. And you know, I know that Don wants to compare himself apparently to Alexander Campbell and his doctrine to that promoted by Campbell. Uh, that's not germane to anything. I mean, if he wants to think of himself that way, that's fine. But the fact is, those who have been affected directly by this doctrine know the truth. And those who have gone before who have passed on to the better land, those who have preached the gospel faithfully, who never once took up with Max Kingism, whose descendants, some of them, a few, have now gone into this, they knew better. They knew better. Max Kingism, 
the Beagle, the Russell Beagle King doctrine is simply not true. It is simply not biblical. It is simply unsustainable from Scripture. You have to assume a lot of things. You have to do a lot of twisting of Scripture and a lot of twisting of phrases, twisting of names, twisting of things around to fit your preconceived notion to make this doctrine fit. Whereas if you simply look at what Scripture says, what it states, and take it for what it states, unless there's indication that it is otherwise, you have to do a lot of hermeneutical gymnastics to assume that it means something else. Yes, the Humpty Dumpty hermeneutic phrase fits well with what he's doing, with what they are doing, with what they are promoting because it simply is not part of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, my friends, is summarized in 1 Corinthians 15. It is summarized quite well at the beginning of that passage. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power, not a power, not one of two, not this and Judaism, not this and the Mosaic Law, which is somehow gradually passing away. No, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is an undenominational gospel. That is the fact is it rejects denominationalism. It is undenominational. It's not ecumenical. It doesn't embrace everybody regardless of differences. It is the gospel of Christ. And if we don't preach the simple gospel of Christ and teach the simple gospel of Christ, we stand condemned. All these man-made doctrines that oppose the gospel, including covenant eschatology, realized eschatology, Max Kingism, all of this stands in diametric opposition to what Jesus died for. It stands in diametric opposition to what Paul declared so beautifully and so clearly in Romans 1 that he pictured so wonderfully in Romans 6. We are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For he that is dead to sin is freed from sin. That's the gospel that I have preached since 1978. That's the gospel that I believe in firmly and will never reject until the day I die. I do not accept any man-made doctrines. I do not accept any man-made teaching. I accept only what this book says. If it says it, I accept it. If it doesn't, I reject it. And that's any kind of man-made teaching that will undermine the truth of Almighty God. I declare to you, my friends, the same thing that they declared in the first century. I contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all time delivered to the saints. It is that in which I put my trust. It is my hope and my trust that this doctrine that Don teaches will go the way of Montanism and the Hale-Bopp Comet to be obliterated from the face of history until it is no more, that all people will unite on truth, the gospel of Christ, and reject everything that is in opposition to it. Once again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your time and your careful consideration and your careful study. And may God bless all of us as we strive to do His will.